In many regards, Final Fantasy III may be one of the most important games in the franchise. While Final Fantasy I is an undeniable classic, Final Fantasy III built the foundation that the rest of the series goes on to... <sighs> no, I, I can't do the big fake out intro again. I just got home from the doctor and they said my blood results came back with dangerous levels of irony poisoning. Final Fantasy III hasn't aged the best. It's an ambitious game with good ideas, but every version is fundamentally held back because Squaresoft tainted the game by committing the cardinal sin. What is that sin, you ask? Being an NES game. Fuck the NES, all my homies hate the NES. No such thing as a good NES game. It has solid ones, maybe, that were one day remade into great games on at least the SNES. But the NES itself? No. Welcome back to my retrospective on all of the Job System Final Fantasy games, where I guarantee no consistent tone nor analytical style. Today's flavor of analysis is downtrodden, broken, and deceased from mid. Apologies that I can't match the enthusiastic whimsy of the last video. Make no mistake, I don't think this game is good, but I don't think it's the worst game ever, either. It's a hard game to have an extreme opinion about, so join me as I spend some time desperately trying to do just that. This is Getting a Job, a Final Fantasy III Retrospective. Now, there are three main versions of FF3 we could discuss in this video. The Famines original, the 3D remake initially made for the DS and since ported elsewhere, and the full 2D remake based on the original version with the recent Pixel Remaster. Fun fact, Final Fantasy III was initially passed on for an English localization. The SNES was on its way, so Square decided to jump on the new hotness of Final Fantasy IV instead. FF3 wasn't officially released in the West until the DS remake, which expanded on a few systems, made the gameplay worse, and wrote in one extra dimension into each of the main characters. Now, while that sounds rather exciting, having gone to college for a math-based degree, I can calculate with reasonable certainty that 0 plus 1 is still a pretty small number, but you might want to check my math on that one. To restate what I said last episode, I'll be playing the Pixel Remasters for these early job system FF games, and 3 is no exception. Outside of a couple issues, these remasters are pretty much the most accessible versions of these games. For 3 in particular, I'd even argue that it's straight up the best version for several reasons, of which I'll try to explain a few of those later. Now, I need to make it clear, I won't be discussing FF3's story that much, basically because I find it less memorable than FF1 somehow. Is that game thematically deep either? No. But it does have cool Garland time travel. FF3, on the other hand, is like an episode of Barney. You start your journey by naming this world's four Blorbos of Light. I went with Scrimblo, Blimbo, Grenblo, and Primbliss. Look, since FF games start to have real characters from here on out, I had to get quirky names out of my system one last time. From there, they stumble upon a crystal of light that tells them to go out, get jobs, and save the world. I would simply not live in a fantasy setting if I didn't want the world to always be on the cusp of death. But that's just me. I'm built different. Blorbino's over here, built regular. We're just normal men. If Final Fantasy 1 was working your first part-time job at an ice cream parlor, Final Fantasy 3 is doing your taxes. Which is to say that it's not fun, takes a really long time to get through if you're a freelancer, and the system feels designed against you and to frustrate you. But your tax return is Final Fantasy V. FF3. God. I wish I liked you more. You start off inoffensive enough, promising even, a few annoyances, but an overall good time until the end, which dive bombs so hard that it taints the entire experience. From the moment you start, FF3 shows potential. You're given a small pool of jobs to experiment with, different party combinations, and this time, you can change them on the fly. That makes it so there's no chance for you to get locked into a bad party combination by accident, especially since monks are kind of useful now. Kind of. Again, according to my math, one is a greater number than zero. Can we check that one? I'll start with a compliment. To give them credit, there is a large amount of jobs to choose from in this game. 
but then I'll take their paper back and change it to half credit because most are either useless or exist to be used for a single fight and then subsequently tossed aside, like the Scholar which was only made to use the analyze ability on a single boss. Please proceed to tell me in the comments how you did a scholar only run and how it's secretly very Kino peak. You know, while I'm already gearing up to get placed on the cross for my sacrilegious takes, let's start a tradition with these videos. To the worst, most useless job in the entire game, I hereby award the Jobber Medal. Scholar, you win the very first ever Jobber! You might argue that it has utility at all, so therefore isn't useless, but you need to remember these are very biased. And I'm also going to dock a ton of points for it being bad at everything else and taking up space. Also, before you go, but the Onion Knight, I'm keeping it off the hot seat because it's your starting class. And that just wouldn't be fair. Cook these kids long enough and they'll come out blooming. There are some cool jobs here though, like the series first playable Dragoon. You could argue that Dragoon is also only really useful for one part of the game, but I think they still have a solid damage output compared to most late game physical based jobs. So you could definitely keep one around until you get ninja, and you'd be fine. So for that, and the fact that dragoons are cool as shit, they just barely pass the incredibly low jobber bar held by Scholar. In terms of general combat mechanics, there isn't terribly much to say unless you really want to get into the nitty gritty of how it all works. Like, bro, not to get pretentious on you, but defend? Do you have any idea what that means in regards to the themes of the game? Jokes aside, I do value discussing game mechanics in regards to media analysis. And if the game was better, I'd be geeking. But for FF3? No. Not worth it. Deadass, you have my word right now, unless I die. One day this series will cover Lightning Returns, and that video will most definitely be much longer than this one. This game fucking owns, dude! And besides, for most of the games I play, I like to consider my approach to coverage on this channel something I have termed drive-by penis analysis. Because entertaining is my focus, and I don't really want to get too serious. Do it. Say penis. It's a funny word. I won't judge. Just say it out loud. Real quick. Come on. Penis. Don't be so self-serious all the time. Live a little. Cock. I'd rather focus my detailed analyses on the mechanical intricacies of the job system itself. So with his blessing, I'm going to point you in the direction of the absolutely fantastic FF3 analysis by friend of the channel, Ludiskete. He's very smart, well-spoken, and thorough. Seriously, go watch that if you want to see this game dissected down to every pixel regarding its mechanics, story, and mythology. Dude makes incredible stuff, for real. FF3 features a lot of solid half ideas, probably because the standards of the RPG genre were being made in real time. Like, for example, originally there was a system in place that locked switching between jobs behind a capacity point system. FF3 is absolutely the kind of game that will stomp and pout if you aren't playing the right combination of jobs for certain scenarios. So the inclusion of a system that pushes people away from freely experimenting is a bit silly. While the 3D version removed this system, they also implemented their own baffling one with the job adjustment phase. This made newly switched to jobs less efficient for a few battles after switching between them until you grind enough for their stats to go back to normal. I don't care how pretty the Yoshida art is. This just wastes time, and sucks, so we pass on the remake. In the Pixel Remaster, both of these dumb limitations are removed entirely and the game's better for it. Not limiting player experimentation in a job system game turns out to have been a good idea. Imagine that! Although, admittedly, I was pretty boring with my party. Can't really go wrong with two damage dealers, a white mage, and a black mage. But in all fairness, every job in the game falls under one of those categories. Every character can play any of the currently available jobs, and the more you use a certain job, the more proficient that party member becomes in using it. This is tied to the job level, which is explained rather poorly by the game itself, and not the easiest to understand even after some googling. Unlike future entries, which ties unlocking new abilities into progression, job level in this game just increases hit percent and slightly increases spell damage? I think? Less sure on that second point, not gonna lie. 
your job level is increased by gaining job points, which correlate to single actions taken in battle. If you're thinking, hmm, that sounds exploitable, you'd be right. Let's talk about some of the other jobs that stood out to me for both positive and negative reasons. I felt like the physical attacker jobs were rather limited, but I more or less enjoyed the ones on offer. There's not much you can really do to mix up a job where the whole thing is attack enemy with a weapon, so I keep my expectations in check. <laughs> A warrior and monk are pretty crucial to have on your team in the early game, just for their raw damage output, because mages feel kind of useless early on, because of our good friend, the spell charge system. You know, I was too easy on this last time. I didn't know how bad it got. I now see the darkness and FF3 showed me it. Unless you're grinding, you're gonna want to save all of your mages spell charges for the boss. And there aren't any magic potions in this game, just elixirs, which are both rare and finite. So don't use them unless you really need to. But you can't simply make a team of physical attackers for most of a dungeon and then switch to mages for the boss. Anytime you change jobs from magical to physical or vice versa, your spell charges drop to zero. Good balancing on paper, but that also means you need to waste an elixir or run all the way back to a town's inn, which means that your mages stand around doing nothing for most dungeons unless you want them to use up all their spell charges and do squat during boss fights. I know I presented this like a choice, but you're gonna want them for the boss fights because unlike FF1, they are not pushovers. Physical fighters have a consistent use for the entire game, unless you hit one of those three mini dungeons where you need to cast little guy energy on every single party member for one charge each to squeeze through a door or a crack or a tur- Dragon! Win puny, your muscles are tiny, so the nerds who trained at the library need to carry your team now. FF3 really said bottoms rise up. But remember, you already wasted four entire spell charges just to get into said mini dungeon, and now you have to clear the entire dungeon and survive until you get four more charges to turn everyone back to normal. A common strategy is to just make the entire party mages, but that means you probably need to grind for money to buy them all spells. Listen FF3, I work at an ice cream parlor. I can't afford two flares, let alone one in this economy, you hack fucks. Your mini slot also shares a level with other spells you need, so this will just bite you in the ass no matter what. For most of the game outside of this, you're going to need to keep your physical attackers well equipped. Scrimblow was my consistent murder man, going from warrior to knight to dragoon to dark knight. Dark knights introduced as another one-hit wonder job, since there's an entire dungeon that will piss on you if you don't use the job's multi-hit katana attack. Still, it puts out good damage consistently, so this was my physical DPS of choice by the endgame. When Grenblow wasn't dying of Poison Blind Frog, god he is so cool, he started out as a monk, and then I got bored and made him the guy who held the required jobs I didn't want to give to the other three party members. He eventually became a black belt though, which I think he enjoyed. I don't know, he's lines of code, I don't think he actually feels things. I harped on jobs being useless outside of one or two purposes, but I will say I'm glad they tried to make some have value outside of combat. Thieves in particular can open locked doors and dungeons, which is pretty useful for a place like Goldor Manor if you don't want to get keys. There's also an infamous little prank FF3 likes to play with the job system that I feel obligated to talk about. Garuda. This arc is probably the best in the game. As you fly over the city of Seronia, you get shot down, leading to being stuck in this sizable kingdom until you find out the king is a big bird who will fuck you up something severe, not something to trifle with. This is the game saying, we can't just let you turn your brain off and hit the death button anymore. You need to learn our systems inside and out to get- Nah, strategy is nerd shit. Switch the entire party to Dragoons. Jump once. The problem is erased. Who wants a KFG quadruple down, baby? Jobs no longer evolve into final forms like in FF1, and really you don't get much from maxing them out besides that warm feeling in your tummy from finishing a fight quicker. You start with black, white, and red mages, which Blimbo and Primbliss fit into rather well. And eventually you can get Maguses. Magi? Nah, that can't be right either. 
Let's go with Magussies and Devouts if you want to expand on their spell output. Blimbo ended up kind of being a jack of all trades, but spent most of my game being the team's major black magic damage dealer. Primbliss kind of bounced back and forth between a red mage and a white mage before settling into a healer summoner role. Outside of the spell charge system, mages have a lot going on in FF3, which I think is great. If you go for the two secret jobs though, which you should if you want to not die of stress at the end game, a lot of these cool ideas just get funneled into these two roles, and there's no reason to pick any other class. Kinda lame, but it's optional so whatever. What I do like is that as you unlock new jobs, you'll get slightly improved versions of older jobs. So if you realize late you want to switch out your party comp, you don't need to start someone at an earlier caster class and have to grind them up. You'll have to rebuy all the good spells, which means grinding for cash again if you don't have it, but it's a nice thought. Because you need to buy spells, you're basically given permission to use all the jobs available spells once you switch to it. You won't find yourself seeing jobs grow at all outside of stat increases, and you're given all of its abilities at once. Again, old game, won't be too harsh, but if you're looking to jump into a job system game with a progression system that doesn't solely rely on number go up, don't start here. I will say though, I'm glad the Pixel Remaster exists to preserve the original NES experience while modernizing it slightly. As I said before, this was the first time we've ever gotten 2D FF3 in English officially. There was a fan translation for the NES version, but why deal with that when you can have pretty widescreen footage? And again, NES bad. The default font though? Yeah, we all know it sucks. I personally have decided to mod in the Dragon Quest XI font, because that game is the definition of nice and classy with a font that matches. The common one I see used is the Mystic Quest font, and I think that's super valid but a bit too blocky for me. Bold blocky fonts like this make it seem like there's no grace in the dialogue, which there isn't in this game either way, but I figure we need to get some consistency started on these videos early on. I'm a pretty big font guy. You kinda have to be if you do YouTube videos. So just know I'll be eyeballing the upcoming console port of the Pixel Remasters to see what they go with because there is no way this will fly on TVs. Outside of the rudimentary and restrictive job system, FF3 is about everything you'd expect out of an old NES RPG. Go out into the world, talk to NPCs to get hints and learn lore, and figure it out from there. Except. There's a problem now. While FF1 could be obtuse about where it wants you to go next, I'd argue that FF3 feels too linear. A great change for a lot of players. But I'm weird. You typically only have about two places you can go max at any time, so you feel railroaded through the game. And hey, for most RPGs, you'd never see me complain about this because most have a lot going on in the gameplay and story department to keep linear gameplay sections fun. In all fairness, your Blorbos do speak and interact with the world, but for some reason, there aren't any dialogue tags in this version to tell which of your party is saying what. Super weird, but everything they say is so basic it doesn't matter anyway. It's a simple game, so progress boils down to go to new town, get told to dungeon, go there, kill boss, go to next town, repeat until you kill big boss to give you new set of jobs. FF1 on paper seems similar, but it's very Big openness is what makes it feel like an actual adventure. It's not a huge difference, but it knew its limits better and used them to craft a more enjoyable journey. FF3 opens up more later on, but by that point you're basically almost done with the entire game, so enjoy it while it lasts, because... <sighs> But, I'll give them this, FF3 features a sizable overworld to explore considering the console it came out on. The twist that the starting world map was a tiny floating island in a flooded world? Really cool, certified classic moment. And even better when you proceed to unflood the world and get the game's true world map. This is where you'll eventually get the Nautilus, which can fly super fast and dive underwater to explore the ocean floor. And then later you'll get the final airship called the Invincible. And with the exception of providing a new portable base to rest in, the ship is just straight up a downgrade. It's slower, you can somehow trigger random encounters on parts of the map, and its new traversal ability is pretty stupid. Wow! 
My flying airship can now jump! Okay, no. No. I'll be nice. I don't want to fall back on angry reviewer tropes for this video, which is also why I've chosen to remain sober. I'm just gonna suspend my disbelief and take the dumb shit in stride. With both of these at your disposal, which yeah, they don't combine and share improvements, you just have to switch between both like your divorced parents exchanging you for the weekend at a Target parking lot. But that means you can now secret hunt to your heart's content. This mainly boils down to fighting the optional summon bosses. The fights themselves are actually pretty fun and challenging. And once you defeat them, that means you can equip them on your summoner or sage. Summoner is a first for the franchise. You know, FF3 kinda has a lot of these, huh? You got your first submarine, first game to use multiple overworlds, first Sid in a Final Fantasy with a 3 in it, and last but certainly not least, the introduction of the Moogle. You know, the cute Koopo MFs. Man, these adorable guys. God, they're so iconic. Wonder how they're holding up nowadays. Ew, 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 kill it! As you journey on, you start to piece together just kind of what happened to this world. Shadowbringers fans will probably already know what's up, but essentially an imbalance between light and darkness put the world in this state. There's a dude named Zande, Zandi, who cares, who's causing a big ruckus just because he can die. Like, I can die, I am mortal, you're not seeing me end the fucking world over it. Jesus, dude, get a hobby. Zandi, if only model kits existed in your day, I think you would have turned out a lot better. Life is good. Again, Final Fantasy 3 is fine. It's basic, annoying in spots, but so am I, and they still let me in coffee shops. What's the big deal? All of this goes to shit the moment this stupid tower comes into view. The Crystal Tower is where fun goes to die. There is a decent chance that by playing this game with only minimal to occasional grinding, you'll reach this area with your levels around the early to mid 30s. And good luck, buddy. You just try to get through even the ancient maze with that low level shit. Fuck you, your ass needed to grind yesterday. Let's lay out what you can expect here. The Ancient's Maze is an area surrounding the tower. Your ship cannot cross it, and there's only a single save and heal crystal at the beginning of the maze. Huh, the hell's that doing there? Well, that doesn't bode well, anyway. Don't touch that dial now, we're just getting started. After a couple floors of this place, you'll reach this little spot of the grass I like to consider the front yard of the Crystal Tower. Now, as I alluded to earlier, there are no tents in this game. For some reason, you can only fully restore your health and spell charges at a crystal or a bed. So the bed you got that came included with your invincible? Yeah, you uh, you parked that kind of far away, huh? Also, while you can quick save anywhere at any time in the Pixel Remaster, which is a godsend. In all previous versions, this front yard is your only spot to save from now on until the entire end of the game. And between you and those credits, the Crystal Tower Gauntlet. For some reason, which is made worse because the Crystal Tower isn't just one dungeon, but two. Thanks to the Eureka Basement, which has the endgame jobs. For some, okay, well I get the reason there. I just don't like it. This is even harder than the tower, but you're gonna wanna do this because it has the best weapons in the game, secret jobs, and special shops that sell you some really great gear. You can finish the game without these, but you really should get them. If not only for the jobs, definitely the shurikens. They go for a ton of money though, so get back to grinding, you pathetic worm. So here's the grinding strategy. Go to the crystal at the beginning of the ancient maze, heal up, quick save, and then run laps. And that's really just for getting your level high enough. If you want your job level optimized, there's a different trick. And if you remember, you just got two new jobs that start at level one. Make sure to buy new equipment and spells, which might also take several laps in the Ancient Maze Crystal Gram Pacer test, and another trip back through the Eureka for more shurikens. Next, go back to the starting area on the floating continent. Find a group of enemies, reduce their numbers to one, defend with everybody, press the auto button, rinse and repeat. You can grind job levels really fast this way, and at this point I realized that I might as well go all the way and commit to the grind. Literally what else am I doing with my life? 
I aim to get my levels around the 50 to 60 range and my job levels maxed. So, queue up some TV shows, YouTube videos, or an anime, go nuts. Even if you don't try to overlevel, there's a good chance that you'll need to spend a few hours grinding anyway, so why not chill? Here's a list of media that I burnt through since starting this project. Kamen Rider Build, Mobile Suit Gundam, Space Runaway Ideon, The Ideon, A Contact, The Ideon, be invoked, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, Mobile Suit Gundam, Char's Counterattack. I know, I, before you say anything, I started Double Zeta after I just wanted to watch Char's Counterattack. It's pretty good. Both are actually pretty good. Mobile Suit Gundam Hathaway. Mobile Suit Gundam Double O. Mobile Suit Double O Gundam Awakening of the Trailblazer. Mobile Suit Gundam Witch from Mercury. Chainsaw Man. American Horror Story. NYC. Baby Driver. Baby Driver 2. Baby Driver 3. Baby Driver 4. Baby Driver 5. The Quest for More Money. Evergrace 3. 300 chapters of One Piece. Counter Attack Again. What's happening? Where am I? Who am I? For what reason do I exist? Am I stuck for eternity to run these laps in this hallway? No, my child. You are not. That light. Blinding. That could only be from- I am all. Some have called me God. I am everlasting. You may call me Gucci. Holy shit. A convoluted series of references stacked on top of one another. Look upon these cycles upon cycles upon cycles. Happiness cannot exist without hardship. You yourself do a monotonous series of tasks just to live. My god. FF3 is a commentary on life itself. I've never seen anything more beautiful in my entire life. From this distance, it paints a beautiful picture. If I wasn't floating in a big space void, I'd kneel for you, Gucci. I'm sorry for ever doubting you. All is forgiven, my child. You are now ready to receive my beautiful gift. Anything, Gucci. Anything. I'm ready for your wisdom. I give you a boxed PS1 copy of Final Fantasy IX, my true opus. Um, well, I... Uh, uh, what, what's wrong with it? No, I mean, like, it, it's good. It's kind of boring, though. What? I mean, I guess it's a perfect game. It's just, I don't know. It's almost too perfect, you know? I don't get you. Well, no, I, I mean, like, it... I get, I, I guess I'm, 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 you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm good. J just send me back. I think, uh, I think we're running out of footage anyway, so you're, you're mad. I, you, you know what? I'm, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm gonna go. Appreciate it though. Finally make it to the world of darkness, which now has healing crystals to restore your health before the final boss. Never did before. An absolute Baffling exclusion. You have to make it through two to three dungeons, fight a ton of hard bosses, with no point to heal or save between each. What were they cooking? Was the stove even on? You then fight a couple more hundred bosses, whatever, whatever, whatever. You then, after your long journey, reach the cloud of darkness. The true antagonist of the game. This fight. I, I can't, I can't stress this enough. This is considered by many to be one of the hardest mandatory bosses in the Final Fantasy franchise. You are going to need every bit of strategy you can prepare here, because this fight is going to be an absolute grueler. One shuriken, two shuriken, boop, boop, bop, fuck you, credits! I am so good at video games. Sage optional. The theme of this game is that all you need to succeed in life is gains and money. Grind set his life. Woo! Holy fuck, dude, I want to do some push-ups. <sighs> Final Fantasy 3. Changes people is what I would say if I could feel strongly about the game as a whole. I'm honestly surprised Shadowbringers had enough to work with on this game. There's not a lot. 
I don't think anyone loves FF3 more than the 14 team. Couldn't be me, though. The Crystal Tower sucks. Awful final dungeon, probably one of the worst. But everything else is just... fine. It's solid. It just so happens that, unfortunately, the most interesting aspects of this game to discuss are the flaws. If you want to see a job system at its most simplistic, give FF3 a shot. In my opinion, though, this is pretty low on the tier list. That's right, we're also making a tier list from now on. Looking a bit sparse, though, hmm. And while I've exaggerated a lot of my complaints for entertainment purposes, if I were to be more charitable, I think this was pretty neat for the time it was made. But this game is not going to be for everyone, unless you like archaic old RPGs. In that case, though, go play something really out there instead. Play something weird! Check out Phantasy Star 4 or something. Hell, check out Phantasy Star 3. <laughs> Did you know there's a Panzer Dragoon RPG? I do! Please ask me about the Panzer Dragoon RPG! It's so cool! However, if you want a better classic job system game to start with, you're going to want to take a look at the game we'll be covering next time in this series. The Super Famicom classic Final Fantasy V. FF3 is a respectable attempt, but its flaws are hard to look past because to put it bluntly, this game lacks sauce. I can forgive a lot about a game if the sauce tastes good, but in this instance, they cooked this chicken dry. We're talking like a pinch of salt and pepper for seasoning. Did they oil the pan with NyQuil? Hi, I feel like I shouldn't have to be the one to say this, but please, oh my god, do not make the sleepy chicken. This is a bit, oh my god, this will kill you. <laughs> but it's okay, we're gonna let them cook. <laughs> even though, for now, it smells like burning. This iteration of the job system is cool, but overall arbitrary due to some questionable design and balancing decisions. The story certainly tries to do story things, but is ultimately shallow. While the pacing seems promising at first, the endgame exists. I mean, what else can you really say about Final Fantasy III? I promise, I don't hate this game, but I don't really love it either. It just is. Moogles are pretty cute though. I guess that makes the game like a 9 out of 10? I will be back to normal in the next episode, whenever that happens, because, spoiler alert, Final Fantasy V whips. Mainly because video games didn't start getting good until the SNES, and FF's no exception. Oh, who am I kidding? I was lying earlier. There is one good NES game. And that's Final Fantasy 2. I'll never stop loving you, Final Fantasy 2. Still not the best Final Fantasy, though. That goes to Final Fantasy 8. See you next time! This video would not have been possible without the help of the following individuals. So give big thanks to Supreme Zerker for helping me edit the script, Hot Cider for working on the thumbnail, GC Vasquez for providing some extra footage, and Shibuya Gato for helping me edit. They handled the entire Gucci segment for me, and they did great. Also, if you're not aware, the channel is being supported via Patreon. So if you'd like to support what I do and get a decent amount of benefits, such as three-day early access to all videos, behind-the-scenes content, and your name in the credits, check out the link in the description for more info. This month's Metal Royal Slimes are Alex Austin, Autumn Jennings, Corvin and Nora Van, Happy Emmons, Hornkerling, I, Frozen Ace, Jeremy DeForest, Looping Pyre, Moon Watcher, Renteca Bond, Sniggs, Wayne is Boss, and your friend Chuck. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you next time.